Modern mechanical refrigeration is very simple. The theory is merely this. The liquid refrigerant, dichlorodifluoromethane, passes into the thermal expansion valve, breaking into small particles as it passes into the evaporator. Evaporation always takes place at the expense of total heat, or BTUs, of the surrounding cargo. Here, the rapidly moving molecules pass off as free gaseous particles. From the evaporator, the warm gas is drawn into the compressor. The compressor cycle is similar to any adiabatic compression, although there are inefficiencies due to heat losses. Now, the refrigerant... Just a second, sir. I'm afraid we're getting kind of dizzy. How about taking another tack and starting back at the beginning of this refrigeration business? For example, you haven't said a word about refrigeration really being a matter of heat. We actually use heat exchange to make cold. So we have to understand a few things about heat first. Like the law of heat flow. That's easily demonstrated in an ordinary home steam heating plant. In this steam furnace, the heat from the hot flame flows to the water, which is cooler. The water gets warm, and the heat flows from it to the cool radiator. When the radiator is warm, the heat flows out to the cool air in the room. From all this, we can see the law of heat flow. Heat always flows from warmer substances to cooler substances. This heating plant also shows us something else about heat. As the water in the boiler takes on or absorbs more and more heat, it finally changes to steam, a gas. This is boiling or rapid evaporation. Then, in the radiator, as the heat from the steam flows into the room, the steam cools until it finally changes back to water, a liquid. This is called condensation. From this, we see the effect of absorbing heat, a liquid turns to gas. We call this evaporation. And the effect of losing heat, a gas turns to liquid. We call this condensation. Now, it's important when dealing with heat to know how to measure the amount of heat that goes into or comes out of a substance. Measurement of the amount of heat is something entirely different from the measurement of temperature. To demonstrate this, let's put a pound of water in each of two beakers. The water in one beaker is fairly warm. In the other, it's fairly cold. Now, Let's heat the water and let each beaker absorb just enough heat to raise the temperature of each pound of water just one degree on the thermometer. It takes the same amount of time for the water in each beaker to go up one degree. This shows us that no matter what the original temperature of the water is, it takes the same amount of heat to raise the temperature one degree. This amount of heat is taken as a standard unit with which to measure the amount of heat in any substance. It is called a British thermal unit, or simply a BTU. Each beaker of water has absorbed one BTU. So we see that one British thermal unit is the heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit at sea level. The BTU is used to measure the amount of heat in any substance, solid, liquid, or gas. Of course, as the water cools to its original temperature, it gives up one BTU. Now, let's heat the water again, and this time we'll add enough heat, or BTUs, to make it boil. As we all know, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. After the water boils, 
we can keep on adding BTUs, but the temperature of the water will stay at 212 degrees. It won't get any hotter. Well, what's happening to this extra heat? It's being used to make the water change to steam, a gas. Let's see how it looks in a diagram. We'll use a thermometer to represent the temperature of the water. Along this line, we'll show the BTUs being added. Now let's see what happens. Suppose we start with the water at a certain temperature and containing a certain number of BTUs. As the water absorbs BTUs, its temperature goes up until it finally boils at 212 degrees. But as the water absorbs more and more BTUs, its temperature stays the same. This extra amount of heat that does not affect temperature, but which we have to add to make the liquid evaporate and become a gas, is called the latent heat of evaporation. If we cool the gas, it has to lose the same number of BTUs before it will change to a liquid. This is still latent heat, but this time it's called the latent heat of condensation, since we're condensing a gas or changing it to a liquid. Water can change to a gas at ordinary temperatures. If we just let water stand, it will eventually evaporate, that is, turn to a vapor or gas. But it will take longer because we're not applying much heat to it. It gets the latent heat needed for the change out of the air or anything else that is near it. So we see that latent heat is the number of BTUs that must be added to change a liquid to a gas or taken away to change a gas to a liquid. It is this property the ability of a substance to absorb or lose its latent heat as it changes from liquid to gas or gas to liquid that is the basis of a refrigeration system. Up to now, we've seen the law of heat flow, effects of heat, evaporation and condensation, what a BTU is, and what latent heat is. Now let's see if this makes our story easier to understand. Yes. Well, the liquid refrigerant, dichlorodifluoromethane, passes through the thermal expansion valve and into the evaporator, where it absorbs its latent heat of evaporation. Then, to the compressor. From the compressor, the gas, now having absorbed heat during compression, passes into the condenser. This is an ordinary, familiar, immersed tube type with water as the coolant. Beg pardon, sir, but can't we start with a simple refrigeration system first? And it can be simple. For example, suppose you wanted to cool the water in an ordinary canteen. All you have to do is wet the canvas cover thoroughly, then hang the canteen up where the air can circulate around it. Now, here's what happens. As the moisture in the canvas cover evaporates into the air, it absorbs its latent heat of evaporation. Now, where does it get this heat? You guessed it, from the water inside the canteen. As long as evaporation continues, the water in the canteen will stay cooler than the air outside. You're using the moisture in the cover as a refrigerant. You could cool the water faster by using alcohol as the refrigerant. It's just possible that you got a shot in the arm in the Navy, so you know how cool alcohol feels when they swab it on your arm. That's because it evaporates more rapidly and at a lower temperature than water and absorbs more latent heat. Or you could cool the water even faster by using a substance called Freon, which evaporates so easily but it has to be stored under pressure in a tank like this to keep it liquid at all. Freon evaporates 
at a temperature far below the freezing temperature of water. So we can use the latent heat that Freon absorbs when it evaporates to freeze water or to keep food cold. When Freon is released from the tank, it boils and evaporates at once, rapidly absorbing heat from its surroundings. If there's enough moisture in the air, it will freeze and form frost. This is exactly what happens in the cooling coils of a mechanical refrigeration system that uses Freon as a refrigerant. There are many other substances that evaporate at such low temperatures that they make good refrigerants. Ammonia is a good refrigerant and is commonly used in commercial ice making plants but it isn't considered suitable for Navy use because its fumes are irritating and it is slightly inflammable. Carbon dioxide is a good refrigerant too, also used in industrial systems, but chiefly because of the tremendous size and weight of the equipment needed to handle its high pressures, it isn't used in modern Navy systems. Freon is the refrigerant used in most Navy systems today. It is safe, and the equipment needed to handle it is light and compact. Let's see now just how a mechanical refrigeration system works. Let's trace the flow of the refrigerant in a simplified system. Let's start with the refrigerant in liquid form under pressure. Now let's lead the refrigerant to the first main unit of the system, the thermal expansion valve. The thermal expansion valve is simply a small, adjustable opening. As the liquid refrigerant passes through the opening in the valve, it breaks up into a fine spray. At the same time, it enters a space larger than it occupied before. In this larger space, there is less pressure, and the refrigerant expands. This drop in pressure makes it easier for the refrigerant to vaporize or turn into gas. This is the first stage of the refrigeration process, expansion. Now the refrigerant goes on to the next main unit in the system, the evaporator. This is where the cooling takes place. The small particles of liquid refrigerant, with their pressure reduced, now begin to evaporate and turn into gas absorbing heat from the air and food near the evaporator, just as alcohol absorbed heat from your arm. By the time the refrigerant reaches the end of the evaporator coils, it has absorbed enough heat to be completely vaporized. It is now a warm, low-pressure gas. This is the second stage of the refrigeration process, evaporation. The refrigerant has now done its cooling job. But we can't just pipe it overboard, not at the dollar a pound we can't. So now we have to get the heat out of it and use it over again. To do this, we first lead the refrigerant gas into a compressor. The compressor raises the pressure of the gas, brings it back up to the pressure of the liquid refrigerant we started with. In order to have a continuous flow, two or more cylinders are used in the compressor. This, then, is the third stage of the refrigeration process, compression. But the heat has to be taken out of the gas so that it will turn to liquid. So the warm, high-pressure gas is led into the next main unit of the system, the condenser. So that the gas will lose its heat faster, cold seawater is piped into a series of tubes inside the condenser. The warm refrigerant gas circulates over the cold tubes. The cold seawater absorbs heat from the warm gas. 
When the gas is cooled, it turns to liquid. The liquid refrigerant, still at high pressure, of course, flows from the condenser back to the main supply or receiver, then onto the thermal expansion valve and on through the system as before. This is the refrigeration cycle. How about watching it again, quickly? The high pressure liquid refrigerant flows into the thermal expansion valve. It breaks up into small particles and expands into a larger space, becoming a low pressure liquid. It then goes into the evaporator, where it evaporates and absorbs heat. It is now a gas, still at low pressure. Next, it passes into the compressor, where its pressure is raised again to the original pressure of the liquid refrigerant. It comes out as a hot, high-pressure gas. Then, it goes into the condenser, where it gives up its heat and becomes a liquid at high pressure. It then flows back to the receiver and onto the thermal expansion valve for another cycle. We can readily see that part of the system works under low pressure and part of it under high pressure. We can call these parts the low side and the high side. The thermal expansion valve and the evaporator are on the low side while the compressor, condenser, and receiver are on the high side. Now that you've seen this simplified system, let's trace the flow of refrigerant through an actual refrigeration system. This is typical submarine equipment. It is set up this way for instruction purposes. On board, of course, it is crowded into much smaller space. That's why it is especially important to know every part of the system and what it does. And by the way, this is a two-ton system according to the Navy rating. And this might be a good place to explain what that means. Tonnage rating is a measure of the refrigerating capacity of the system, the amount of work it does. It is based on the number of BTUs the system absorbs per hour. Maybe you'd like to know where this rating comes from. Well, it's all based on a ton of ice. Since one ton of ice, in melting, absorbs 12,000 BTUs per hour, a refrigeration plant that absorbs this amount of heat is rated as a one-ton system. Therefore, a two-ton system, such as this one, would absorb 24,000 BTUs per hour. If this system were to be used for air conditioning, it would not have exactly the same rating. That's because of slightly different operating conditions. Now, let's go ahead and trace the flow of refrigerant and see what the parts of the system actually look like. This is the thermal expansion valve, where the high-pressure liquid refrigerant breaks up into small particles and expands, coming out as a low-pressure liquid and going into the evaporator. Here, the refrigerant evaporates and absorbs the heat from the air and food in the compartment. If the temperature produced by the evaporator is low enough, any moisture in the air around the evaporator will freeze and form a frosty coating on the coils. Here is the compressor, which acts much like a pump. It really has two jobs. It raises the pressure of the refrigerant gas, as we've seen, and in addition, it keeps the refrigerant circulating through the system. The inside of the compressor looks something like the inside of an automobile engine. It has cylinders, pistons, valves, connecting rods, and a crankshaft. An electric motor drives the compressor crankshaft. Usually, two or more cylinders are used for smoother operation and to keep an even flow of the refrigerant gas. From the compressor, the refrigerant goes to the condenser. Here, the warm, high-pressure refrigerant gas flows around a series of tubes. Cold seawater flows inside the tubes. The water absorbs heat from the gas, cooling the gas until it turns to liquid. Incidentally, as long as Freon is under pressure, it will liquefy even with the seawater found in the tropics. 
which may be as warm as 85 degrees. The liquid refrigerant then flows into the receiver or storage tank. It then flows back to the thermal expansion valve. Here, the cycle begins all over again. Gauges and controls are centrally located so the operator can readily check the operation of the system. Although the system is automatic, no machine ever ran itself without some attention. Here, a glance at these gauges tells exactly what is going on. So you see, the key to modern mechanical refrigeration is latent heat. And the part it plays in changing a liquid to a gas and back to a liquid again. Once you know and understand this story, you'll know what you're doing when you're operating this equipment. So as we have seen, the refrigerant Freon expands and evaporates, absorbing its latent heat of evaporation and turning to gas. It is then compressed and cooled, gives up its latent heat of condensation and turns to liquid. It goes back to the receiver and onto the thermal expansion valve to complete the refrigeration cycle. The cycle then repeats itself over and over again. When you know what the refrigeration cycle is, you have a good basis for understanding mechanical refrigeration.